OK, folks, let's get started. So firstly, welcome everybody to this. It's the third in the, the series of uh, Inspire seminars that E3G, CSEN and SOAS have been um, leading on, on responses, <coughs> excuse me, responses to the crisis. Um, today, we're taking a, a slightly different perspective to the, the previous sessions. We're thinking a little bit about the past, but only a little bit about the past in the sense that we're going to think about what we've learned um, and both from the, the previous financial crisis, but really about how we're going to take this forward uh, and the, the, the lessons learned forwards. Uh, we're going to have three speakers in order, uh, Dimitri Zengelis uh, from University of Cambridge, um, uh, Bob Litterman from uh, Kipos Capital and Zoe Knight from HSBC Centre of Sustainable Finance. There is going to be plenty of time at the end for Q&A discussions. The webinar will be recorded and goes up on the Inspire um, uh, website hosted by SOAS. Uh, so you will be able to check back over it and also if you have missed previous seminars in this series or want to be kept up to date on future seminars, you'll be able to find those all there. So without any further ado, uh, I'm delighted to hand over to Dimitri Zengelis from Cambridge, who's going to be our first speaker. And Dimitri, thank you not only for speaking, but for being such a, a major driving force in pulling this together. Over to you, Dimitri. Ronan, thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me. And I'm now going to attempt to share my slides. Uh, let's see how that goes. So far, so bad. Nothing. Oh, I, I, maybe you're seeing it. Are you seeing my slides now? It's looking good so far. If you go to slideshow mode, and we're sorted. There we go. I'm trying to do it. Unfortunately, <laughs> no, I won't. Um, okay. You got it. Well done. Very good. Where are we? Good. Um, well, good. Good afternoon. Everybody, good morning. Um, if you're uh, in uh, on, in the US, um, so we're going to talk today a little bit about learning some of the lessons and insights from the past. But I'm going to set a slightly macroeconomic context to the um, post-COVID uh, uh, recovery plan. I think. I mean, I think of this in two ways. You know, there's there's COVID rescue and COVID recovery, and they're very different. Rescue is very different to recovery because you don't want to stimulate the economy at a time when you're actually actively trying to limit social and economic interactions in order to contain a pandemic. Um, but once you are on top of the pandemic, and we hope that that time will come, the emphasis will shift very much uh, towards recovery. Um, and that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to put this in the context of the interface between uh, fiscal and monetary policy. And uh, let me just try and get the picture of me out of the way. I don't need to see myself. There we go. Um, and I think the context here really matters a lot because even before um, the present downturn, indeed, even before the great financial crash of 2008 and certainly afterwards, most of the major economies were really struggling um, uh, with unsatisfactory and slow growth, slow productivity growth and what is really considered to be a rather inequitable distribution of income and indeed wealth. Uh, when we factor in some of the uh, gains in asset prices and property prices that have accrued mostly to wealthier individuals. Um, another key feature of this was that inflation uh, remained subdued and interest rates were historically depressed. And most importantly here, so too was the real rate of interest. It's been pretty much languishing close to zero, uh, certainly in terms and more recently even in nominal terms as well with policy rates being turned no uh, negative in some cases and forward yield curves suggesting that the markets expect that kind of uh, low real interest rate environment to endure. And what this is clearly telling us, because you know the interest rate is the price that uh, allows ex post savings to equal ex post in uh, investment, is that desired savings have been very weak relative to desired investment. So the world is really crying out for investment opportunities, markedly higher investment opportunities. And this is really important because it has implications both for fiscal and for monetary policy. For fiscal policy, it suggests that government should focus on leveraging in investment, you know, both directly through investing itself, but also through providing a policy environment that generates investment in the private sector, 
And for monetary policy, this low interest rate environment, the um, very low neutral uh, real interest rate has meant that, you know, as soon as the economy goes below trend, monetary policy has very little room for maneuver. Uh, because neutral real interest rates are low, uh, the scope to go below the zero bound in nominal terms uh, is uh, very limited, which is why we've been having to experiment with these somewhat uh, extraordinary uh, forms of monetary policy in order to stimulate the economy. Again, this suggests that some of the emphasis has to shift uh, back towards fiscal policy and that fiscal policy and monetary policy need to coordinate. In the short run, we need to boost demand to get the economy out of the classic uh, paradox of thrift, where you know uh, fear of a downturn leads businesses to cut investment uh, and to shed labor, banks to retrench credit, consumers to cut back on spending. And of course, when everybody behaves in that way, um, expectations become self-fulfilling in generating that downturn. That's the risk we're going to have in the recovery phase. And this is very important. Our objective is to stimulate uh, investment in productive assets, in capacity. We want to crowd in capacity. Well, we've uh, undertook a study in the Oxford Review of Economic Policy with Joe Stiglitz, Nick Stern, Brian Canrahan, and uh, Cameron Hepburn, uh, where we argued um, that in the short run, a lot of the kind of clean energy infrastructure investments, but also things like retrofitting uh, buildings, restoring uh, wetlands and forests, tend to be quite uh, labor intensive. Uh, they're not susceptible to offshoring. They're not prone to import. So they impart quite high short run multiplied. But we also argued, and I'll say a little bit about this in a minute, that actually the operation and maintenance of some of these more productive renewable technologies, also the gains from increased efficiency, um, actually pass on energy cost savings to consumers and generate innovation that can actually have very high long run multipliers, and especially uh, in terms of locking into the right things. And how big are these multipliers? Well, we argue that they're in the range of two to three, which means every one dollar of public borrowing can raise uh, output by something like two to three dollars. Um, that's based on a number of studies that have been produced over the, right, the, the last decade. And uh, most recently in the latest fiscal report, the IMF also came out with a multiplier of around 2.7 which is at the upper end of that range. I think that there's plenty government can do through fiscal policy to stimulate investment and to stimulate growth. Um, I won't dwell on this rather busy chart, but just to say that obviously if you're wanting to expand capacity, um, that means investing in um, those assets which offer the greatest potential return in the kind of carbon constrained markets of the future. Now, of course, you know, some of these clean investments aren't the only way to stimulate the economy. Uh, you know, you could build roads, you could build pipelines for oil and gas. And in the past, those may have been very sensible things to do to stimulate the economy. But that's not necessarily a guide to a future which is going to become increasingly carbon constrained and resource constrained, hence the concern about asset stranding and asset devaluation. And we argue that this is about more than just not you know, locking into the wrong kind of infrastructure and spending private and public money propping up fossil fuel intensive assets. It's also about investment in human capital to cure the skills and jobs necessary for the 21st century, to retool and reskill workers, to enable them to participate in the kind of change we're seeing. And that's not just low carbon, it's not just uh, and it, it, uh, resource efficiency, it's also the sort of plethora of um, uh, new technologies that are uh, beginning to hit uh, uh, the uh, supply side of the economy, things like AI, the Internet of Things, data, digitization, nanotechnologies, you know, the whole gamut of this stuff is going to change uh, the way we work, the way we interact, the way we consume, the way we produce. Linked to that, of course, is investment in the right kind of knowledge capital. It's knowledge capital that will shape the economy of the 21st century. Um, without it, we will not be able to get more out of the resources we have in a way that allows us to square both our uh, resource and carbon uh, constraints and our growth demand. So really innovation driving total product to productivity, using limited resources ever more cleverly through the weightless economy, through uh, intangibles and so on is going to be what allows us to expand the envelope without uh, committing to excess uh, use of resources. And that means of course, monitoring natural assets, Natural assets, you know, are, if anything, the only form of capital that is in general in decline. Most of the other forms of capital have been increasing recently. And because these assets are complementary, some of the constraints associated with depleting natural assets are clearly becoming apparent, not just in climate change, but also deforestation, biodiversity loss, overfishing. The focus in particular on renewable assets rather than non-renewable assets. I'm less concerned about minerals 
disappearing when we can substitute out of them um, than I am about some of these renewable assets which are prone to irreversible thresholds, many of which we are reaching. And then finally, there's social capital and the focus on inclusivity and equality, which has been a major constraint and potentially a political constraint to sustainable growth in the future. In the interest of time, I won't dwell on that, but you can always uh, look at these things later. We, one of the surveys that we undertook um, as part of this uh, Oxford Review of Economic Policy study was we, we looked at uh, something like 230 key uh, practitioners in finance ministry, central bank, senior economists, that kind of thing. Not your usual sort of suspects when it comes to you know, the environment. These are not tree huggers by nature. And we asked them to rank some of the key policy initiatives in terms of their ability to generate growth multipliers and also their ability to uh, produce climate positive impact. In other words, um, move us towards a net zero economy. And what was of interest, and I think very different to the great financial crash, was this positive correlation. And also that the number of policies were ranked in the top right hand corner. That's the corner that we want to be in because it's both growth positive and it's also uh, climate positive as well. And um, you know, policies like clean R&D, clean energy infrastructure, connectivity infrastructure, but also green spaces and buildings upgrades were found to be both uh, environmentally positive and growth positive. And it tends to put, uh, it tends to suggest that there's an increasing understanding that growth and sustainability are not uh, conflicted. They're not traded off. They're not at odds with each other. And in fact, they can be put to very complementary use, as we have argued in our paper. So this isn't just us talking about it, it's others believing it. And of course, expectations matter, because if enough players believe that this is going to happen, there are what we call strategic complementarities, whereby um, the act of investing, I'll take this slide off, actually, because it's, uh, I'll stick, stick to this, the act of uh, believing that everybody else is going to invest in, for example, green technologies changes the payoff to you investing in green technologies. If you're the only person, the costs are high, the risk are high, you won't invest. If everybody else is investing, you'd expect the costs of technologies to come down, finance to become less niche and new market opportunities to open up, so you'll invest. The very act of investing in the new economy generates the cost reductions that makes it sustainable. My final slide is just to focus a little bit on uh, policy. You know, we've seen this unprecedented government response to the pandemic, and that's pushed debt uh, in many developed economies to historic highs relative to GDP. Uh, we're also now, as the economy moves from rescue to recovery, there are calls for further spending of the kind that I've made um, in order to stimulate investment. And of course, that uh, threatens to even higher uh, public debt to GDP uh, as we try and boost productive capacity. Now, clearly, um, you know, um, there is... Uh, there are risks associated with excessive debt. They increase uh, a, a government's vulnerability um, to debt crises in the future. But there's no magic ceiling to where debt to GDP should be. And history suggests that the best way to reduce debt to GDP in pretty much all the major economies is to focus not so much on the numerator by fixating on uh, a, a rapid deficit reduction, which can often be counterproductive, but to actually focus on the denominator. In other words, to use fiscal policy strategically to generate growth, sustained growth in a way that allows debt to GDP uh, to come down. And that indeed is the only uh, sustainable and durable way history has shown, but also theory tells us to reduce debt to GDP. Um, you know, the failure of austerity in a number of countries post uh, the great financial crash, I think is testimony to um, the idea that the wrong way to bring about debt sustainability is uh, in the short run, at least, through, um, through, through reducing deficits. In the long run, of course, you will want to balance your current budget over the cycle and stabilize debt to GDP ratios. But if you can boost GDP, that's the best way to secure sustainability. I will stop there because I think I've exceeded my 10 minutes already, but hopefully plenty of material uh, to think about. Actually, thank you so much. Uh, your timing was perfect. Um, your timing was perfect. Um, uh, can I, uh, sorry, I'm delighted to see somebody has, has put something in the Q&A. Can I just remind everybody, we will be opening this for discussion with everybody. At the end of this, please log any questions you have as they come along. Now, my pleasure to hand over to Bob, Bob Letterman from Kepos Capital. Bob, over to you. Thank you, Ronan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am uh, acting as the chairman of the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission subcommittee on uh, climate related market risk and I'm going to talk about our report so let me try and bring that up here. 
uh, here. Let's see, do I have that? It's coming up, Bob. That's looking good. Uh, okay. Do you see the slideshow? Uh, slideshow hasn't come. I can see the slides, not the slideshow yet. Oh, wait, there it's we coming. Go. Okay, good. There you uh, go. Thank you. So before I dive into this report, let me uh, talk about the lessons learned. And in this report, there is a uh, forward that I wrote uh, talking about lessons from risk management that apply to uh, climate. They also apply, by the way, to COVID. Uh, and, and there's three lessons that I mentioned. Uh, the first one is that you have to worry about uh, extremely bad but plausible scenarios. That's, that's a lesson from financial risk management. It applied to COVID, it applies to, uh, uh, to climate, uh, and unfortunately, at least in the US, uh, we didn't apply it very well to COVID and we haven't applied it uh, very well to climate. Uh, we'll talk about that in the report. Second lesson from risk management that I'd like to mention uh, is that uh, time is a scarce resource. You know, there was a study out of Columbia University that suggested that in the US, if we had responded to COVID a week earlier, we would have uh, reduced the death rate by half in the first two months. So uh, similarly with respect to climate, we don't know how much time we have. We haven't yet uh, priced the risk, and that's a fundamental mistake. And uh, and, and not doing it in time, uh, we can come back to that. But it's it's very uh, it increases the risk dramatically. And then the third lesson uh, from risk management that maybe is not quite as obvious uh, is that the purpose of risk management is to identify risks and to quantify risks and to make sure that they're being priced appropriately. That is to say that the purpose of risk management is not to minimize risk, but to price it. And uh, the big mistake we made in the great financial crisis uh, was that we weren't pricing the risk embedded in mortgages, the systematic risk. Uh, similarly, with respect to climate, we're not pricing the systematic risk embedded in emissions. And, uh, and that's the fundamental uh, mistake that we're making. And it's also the most important uh, an urgent uh, thing that we have to change. So uh, now to this report. Uh, the first thing I wanna say about the report is it was amazing that it was even commissioned uh, in the US right now under this administration. Have to give a lot of credit to uh, Commissioner Russ Benham, who was the sponsor of this report, one of five commissioners on the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. The entire commission, which is three Republicans and two Democrats, all appointed by President Trump, unanimously uh, agreed with uh, Commissioner Benham that the CFTC should commission this uh, report on managing climate risk in the US financial system. I would also give uh, Commissioner Benham a lot of credit for uh, making it a very broad mandate. Uh, he told us not just to focus on what the CFTC should do, but what all financial regulators and frankly, all of the US government uh, should focus on. And uh, he created a very, uh, good committee. Uh, there were 35 members originally, one dropped off. So we ended up with 34 members and uh, they represented banks, insurance companies, uh, basically a very broad group of stakeholders in the financial system. Also data providers, uh, commodities exchange, uh, oil and agricultural companies, uh, academics, think tanks and environmental organizations. A lot of expertise. Uh, commissioner and his chief of staff also worked very hard to make sure that we have the right people. So for instance, from an oil company, we had the head of risk management. We didn't have a uh, you know, government relations or someone from the, uh, the legal office. And Commissioner Benham asked for a consensus report. He wanted to know what could we all agree on. Uh, he wanted a high level report. He asked us to uh, focus on uh, try and get under 50 pages and try and come up with as many as specific recommendations as we could. Now, I think we, uh, we met every goal. I was very pleased with this report, uh, except that it took us 165 pages. We agreed on much more than I, I, or I think the commissioner expected, including 53 specific recommendations with supporting material. So let's talk about what we agreed on. Uh, well, before that, this slide, uh, we were given a broad mandate and uh, so what did we talk about? Well, we broke into these uh, different work streams that ended up writing different chapters. Uh, 
Uh, they focused on climate risks, uh, data and analysis, the role of uh, financial regulators, scenarios and stress tests, uh, climate risk disclosure, and uh, the last chapter, financing the net zero transition. So you can see we took a very broad uh, view of the issues, and uh, I hope you can all get a copy of this and read it. So what did we agree on? Well, the main thing we agreed on, which I mentioned before, is the fact that we're not pricing the uh, net externality of emissions, and we need appropriate incentives to reduce emissions. The first meeting of this subcommittee, which started over a year ago, and the report was just published last month. The first uh, meeting, we sat around the table and I talked about the lessons of risk management. I talked about the need to price the risk, the fact that we weren't pricing it, and this is a fundamental mistake. And as we went around the table, there was no one who disagreed. We all agreed we've got to price emissions. And not only that, but this is the most urgent thing we've got to do. We will be dealing with climate risk for decades and decades. We will probably have to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at extremely large scale. Uh, but all of that is in the future. What we need to do right now immediately is, I call it slam on the brakes. And the only break we have are the incentives that we create to reduce emissions. And everyone in the financial markets understands that I'm a, a quant. Uh, I spent a career on Wall Street trying to pick up the dimes and nickels and pennies that were there when you hedge out other risks and there were uh, opportunities to take advantage of. Uh, the, the financial markets are incredibly efficient, but they take advantage of opportunities given the incentives that we have. So right now we're not pricing climate risk, the incentives go the wrong way, and the financial markets are creating capital flows that move in the wrong direction. So until this fundamental flaw is fixed, capital flows in the wrong direction. Uh, that's the context for our report but not the focus of a report. We didn't focus on, for example, where should emissions be priced? Although that's something I focused a lot of my attention on. And the answer is we need very significant uh, incentives to reduce emissions. This is not an ease on the brakes scenario, maybe 20 years ago, but not today. Today, we need to slam on the brakes. So recommendation number one of this report is that the United States should establish a price on carbon. It must be fair, economy-wide, and effective in reducing emissions consistent with the Paris Agreement. This is a quote right from the report. This is the single most important step to manage climate risk and drive the appropriate allocation of capital. Okay, but we uh, focused on a lot of other things as well. So this report reflects agreement around a fundamental set of uh, principles, the need for collaboration with international efforts to address climate-related financial market risk, the need for leadership by the financial regulators to guide an iterative process forward while leaving room for American financial innovation, a, cons a consensus about the need to Im quickly improve the quality of data, analytics, and understanding of the many dimensions of climate risk, and the need for approaches to scenario analysis, stress testing, and what will no doubt be a complex iterative path toward the development of meaningful disclosure on material climate risk information. All of these are quotes from the report. Now, what about central banks? And I, I, I have to tell you, we tried to be polite in this report. So we didn't say the Fed should. We said something like all relevant federal financial regulatory agencies should incorporate climate related risks into their existing monitoring and oversight functions. And we were talking not just about the Fed, obviously, but about the SEC, the CFTC, insurance regulators, um, uh, credit uh, uh, ratings and so on. Uh, regulators should further develop internal capacity on climate related risk measurement and management. Research arms of federal financial regulators should undertake research on the financial implications of climate related risk. Research should also include the impact of climate risk on financial system assets and liabilities. Financial supervisors should require bank and non-bank financial firms to address climate-related financial risks through their existing risk management frameworks in a way that is appropriately governed by corporate risk management. And finally, financial reg authorities should consider integrating climate risk into their balance sheet management and asset purchases, particularly relating to corporate and municipal debt. International coordination is essential. Uh, we, we, clearly focused on Europe, which is ahead of the US. Again, we tried to be uh, polite, but we referenced the NGFS 53 times. 
we said federal financial regulators should actively engage with their international counterparts to exchange information and draw lessons on emerging good practice regarding the monitoring and management of climate related risk. Working closely with financial institutions, regulators should undertake, as well as assist financial institutions to undertake on their own, pilot climate risk stress testing, as is being undertaken in other jurisdictions and as recommended by the NGFS. And US regulators should engage in international forums, such as the NGFS, to ensure that climate risk stress testing conducted in the United States is comparable to similar exercises in other jurisdictions and avoid duplicative exercises for institutions with a multi-jurisdictional footprint. We uh, talked about fiscal policy as well. The transition to a resilient net zero emissions future is a linchpin for managing long-term climate risk for the US economy and households. Uh, the US government's fiscal authority, its capacity to spend, borrow, and structure the tax code can significantly increase the scale of investment in sustainable projects. Fiscal policy can support the many co-benefits of transition, including job creation and the promotion of equity for historic and marginalized communities. Additionally, it can drive continued innovation by funding basic scientific research and the deployment of mature technologies. Fiscal policy includes economic stimulus, disaster relief, and infrastructure, all of which have implications for climate risk. Future spending offers possibilities for reducing the structural barriers holding back the transition to a net zero emissions future while simultaneously supporting the economy. Policymakers' ambition should be to enhance the economy's long term potential, including by managing climate risk, not to maintain the status quo. Now, before concluding, I just want to mention one other uh, application. This is not part of the uh, CFTC report, but at my firm, Kepos, uh, we have been looking at what is the global incentive to reduce emissions. And it turns out those incentives come in many forms of which carbon taxes and cap and trade systems are actually the least important. And I, I know this slide is probably a little difficult to read, but what we're looking at here are the incentives created not only by carbon taxes and cap and trade systems, but also gasoline and other fossil fuel taxes uh, gasoline taxes, by the way, are the largest incentive globally and including in the United States to reduce emissions. And subsidies of uh, fossil fuels, both production and consumption, which are huge, especially in many other countries. Uh, renewable portfolio standards, feed in tariffs, and uh, low carbon fuel standards, all of which are subsidies to uh, uh, reduce emissions. Uh, and what you can see, uh, first of all, it is, uh, and I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but over here on this world map, the circles represent the uh, amounts of emissions. So the largest circle is in China, uh, has the largest emissions. The US is second, uh, we have about 15% of global emissions in the United States. And then you can see other circles uh, in, whoops, sorry about that. Oh, geez, there we go. Uh, I don't know if we're still in slideshow, but uh, from the current slide, are we there? Um, so, uh, and then what you can see in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean is a scale that shows where the globally averaged uh, incentive to reduce emissions is. It's eleven and a half dollars per ton of carbon today. Today, meaning uh, 2018, was the most recent data. We actually have just updated this uh, for the 2019 data, which has become available. And the global average price is now about $13 a ton. And what you can see uh, down here is a little time series. I'm sure you can't read the uh, scale, but it starts uh, in 2008. Uh, this is 2018. Uh, so 2019 is basically a continuation of the linear increase in carbon and, uh, incentives uh, globally. Uh, the minimum here at a dollar and a half is uh, in 2012. And then uh, if we look over here on the left-hand side, you can see the average incentives by country. I'm sure you can't read these uh, along the horizontal axis, but the highest uh, price, and you can see on the graph here, the uh, colors in blue are higher prices. The highest is in France at about $100 per ton. Uh, and uh, the US is down here at about 17. Uh, and this is Venezuela, so you can see it's th these countries in red are mostly in the Middle East. Those are the uh, countries where there's a net incentive to, re to increase emissions. 
Um, the incentive, in other words, goes in the wrong direction for those. Uh, the worst case is Venezuela, although it has very small emissions, it has very large subsidies to fossil fuels. So uh, what we've got to do, obviously, in the next uh, couple of years is get these incentives uh, much, much higher. We need globally uh, harmonized incentives to reduce emissions at an appropriate price. That's the most urgent step we can take. And uh, hopefully that'll start in the US uh, after the election that's coming up here in less than a week. Uh, so I'm very optimistic that we will get a new administration, a new uh, Senate and a carbon tax uh, next year uh, at a significant level. And hopefully then uh, very quickly we'll get harmonized global incentives around the world. So I'll stop there, thank you. Uh, thank you very much and, and, and remind me to phone you next week to see how you're feeling um, uh, after that. <laughs> um, excellent presentation and I loved your barometer slide that was that was so graphic um, oh, I'm going you. to hand over straight away to you Zoe uh, and you're going to take us through the next few minutes thank you thanks thanks Ronan um, and thanks Dimitri and Bob for your opening presentations very insightful and I'm going to refer to a couple of pieces from them as I walk through some slides uh, about what HSBC is doing and what the market itself is looking at in relation to furthering the sustainable finance agenda. First off though, um, just for those of you that don't know me, my name's Zoe Knight. I run our Centre of Sustainable Finance at HSBC. HSBC is a global organisation with around 40 million clients and operating in just over 60 countries across all elements of the financial system. So I'm delighted to be joining you today to walk through this, the building forward thinking in relation to how policy drivers can incentivize a shift to a more sustainable pathway going forward. And if I can just flip through, there we go, flip through the next slide. What I'd like to start off with is thinking about the exam question around repurposing for sustainable, uh, sustainable growth. Essentially, what we're talking about here is looking at how institutions can really strategically steer themselves to support an economy which is fit for purpose for everyone, both in terms of addressing the challenges of climate change and other sustainability factors and providing a backdrop where livelihoods are supported by quality jobs and contribution to that overall social perspective. The good news is going forward, the vast majority of investors and organizations want to build a better future. So at HSBC, we did a survey throughout the months of July and August, where we talked to investors and uh, issuers about their appetite for addressing environmental, social and governance issues going forward. And we found that 94% of them think that environmental, social and governance, ESG issues are very important for the future. So, you know, the good news is there's an appetite across the board of, of how to think about these factors and how to work them in going forward. And in fact, 97% of issuers said that they would be redeploying capital to capture uh, a, a integration of environmental, social and governance factors in the future. So, you know, that's really good news. There's a lot of appetite to work on how we restructure the economy. So the question is not why, uh, it's more of a how to implement a way forward that is future, that, that is different from the past in the terms of capturing those environmental externalities that we haven't been able to capture historically and that has resulted in this problem that we have with climate change and rising emissions. So building on the point that Bob made about incentives, it is all about putting the right incentives in place to deliver those outcomes. And I think there are, there are two that I really want to talk through before diving into what HSBC is doing more of. So first off, transparency and disclosure. Now I know that to many of you, this isn't gonna be new news, but it really is important in terms of driving change. So first off, for the financial system in particular, 
It's about transparency of financial flows and how they're being deployed to support a low carbon outcome rather than the traditional, the traditionally fossil fuel driven economies of the past. Now, of course, that is easier said than done because uh, we would ideally like to know exactly how the energy system can transition. And there are very many nuances, not least across heavy industry and high energy users in terms of how we get to that net zero outcome. But first off, we need to really be able to tell whether financial flows are being allocated in a way that supports that future outlook. So transparency about finance is driven by how companies are disclosing on what they're doing in terms of investment capital. And, and disclosure provides signals to all of the players in the, across the capital system, whether that's the regulators, uh, asset owners and asset managers or banks themselves, in terms of how to better price risk in relating, relation to those, uh, those capital decisions. So, as I mentioned, this isn't new news, and we've heard from Bob that there's a lot of work in progress around addressing how risks should be factored into financial decision making, and consequently, how we can, on the flip side, understand more about where the opportunity set lies in relation to finance being able to drive a real economy outcome. So. The transparency and disclosure side provides a signal intent of what corporates, governments, governments, regulators and investors are thinking in terms of climate decisions. And it, it tells us about the direction of travel. But nonetheless, in order to derive that zero carbon outcome or zero carbon economic outcome, we actually need to determine whether, for want of a better word, entities are putting money where their mouth is and actually driving the change in the real economy that's necessary to move at pace. And so here's where the targets element comes in. And this is slightly trickier because whereas transparency and disclosure is purely about reporting, targets require an understanding about exactly what needs to be achieved in terms of emission reduction to generate that end state transformation that we're driving towards. So for example, within a power or utility sector, it's straightforward to measure absolute emissions and, and, and get on a pathway that has a net zero outcome by 2050, and that would be aligned with the aims of the Paris goals. Within heavy industry, for instance, like steel, cement, or, or areas of transport, shipping, aviation, it's much more difficult to set those emissions targets in order to be able to see whether or not companies and industries are moving at the pace required to, to be on track to, to limit temperature rises. So we know to a certain extent what to do. We just have a certain degree of uncertainty around scenario setting of what the future can look like. But nonetheless, it's important to get started on that journey. And so now I'm gonna take you through a, a slide about how HSBC is viewing the problem. So two weeks ago, we set out a climate, am climate ambition, which is to build a net zero global economy. We're gonna do that by becoming a net zero bank. By 2050, we will have aligned our finance emissions to a net zero outcome. Hopefully we'll be able to do that sooner than 2050, but for now we've got the frame or we're getting the framework in place and we're addressing sectors and thinking about how this can be done. And that's a quite an ambitious statement because we don't have all of the methodologies and thinking in place right now to know exactly what that 2050 is gonna outcome is gonna look like. But nonetheless, as I mentioned, there is so much work in progress across the industry as a whole, whether that's looking at science-based targets, the Paris Agreement Capital Transition Assessment Tool, which is what we're using to look at transition pathways, other initiatives on emissions accounting, like PCAF, the Portfolio Carbon Accounting Framework, sorry, the Paris Carbon Accounting Framework, um, and the network for the greening the financial system and other regulatory drivers on climate stress testing, which all together are helping us think about what that future 
scenario, an emission scenario looks like, so that we can start to be able to benchmark our customers across their progress in terms of delivering that net zero outcome. Because of course, the financial system as a whole is responsible for portions of emissions that it's financing, but it's the real economy itself that is responsible for the transition. So we have to be able to understand the future pathways of a, of a range of sectors in order to assess how well we allocate capital in the future and how we manage the risks related to climate factors, whether that's transition risk that is coming from higher carbon pricing or whether it's the physical aspects of warmer temperatures that will disrupt supply chains or real estate availability, for example. So we've got three pillars to the strategy. One of them is the becoming a net zero bank. The second one is supporting our customers. And as I mentioned, you know, this real economic transformation is going to come from the move of high energy use and high climate impact sectors along a decarbonisation journey. Now, we know that the vast majority of that is going to be helped by a shift at pace to renewable power but it's not happening quickly enough. And we know that we also need to think about the use of hydrogen as a, as a factor to, to help industry, the use of carbon capture, utilization and storage and how that fits in in different geographies and for different industries. And all of these things aren't necessarily exactly well known from a location perspective. So we need to work quite closely with our customers and, and with governments and, and others to understand exactly what that pathway forward looks like. But nonetheless, we have to integrate it into the business as a whole. And this picks up on another point that Bill made, which is we need to make sure that we've got the right people in the room that are working on the um, business as usual activities within the bank and how we can apply the climate lens to all of those activities. And to do that, we're raising awareness and education about the topics themselves, but also the consequences of changing policy to uh, address limiting emissions in the future, whether that's carbon pricing or whether that's thinking about the, the resulting temperature rises and the physical impacts in relation to that. So applying a climate lens to our financing decisions is important, an important way of thinking whether we're supporting the transition with our decisions or not. And then lastly, and this plays onto the point that Dimitri made about crying out for investment opportunities. You know, this is also about unlocking new climate solutions. We know that in the future, we'll be innovating and thinking more about the value of ecosystem services, how we use nature-based solutions to help companies that perhaps have a lower emissions base to start off with, but want to do more, that want to really address the historical emissions that they've been responsible for and actually overcompensate for their environmental impact today. So unlocking those new solutions comes from collaboration across both our own industry and with scientists and academics. It means creating new joint ventures. And one of the things that we did this year was to work with Pollination, a strategic consultancy on nature-based solutions to form a joint venture in our asset management business. And that going forward aims to create um, the world's largest natural capital fund. Similarly, uh, the sustainable infrastructure place is an important uh, piece of work to look at how to attract those investment flows going forward. We know that we don't want to build infrastructure today that locks us into a high carbon trajectory for the future, but we also aren't necessarily very transparent about which infrastructure really will uh, avoid emissions. So for example, we know that renewables are important, but actually in the transport network, <clears throat> making sure that we avoid at all, uh, uh, where possible the use of sort of road and, and, and moving to rail instead of other high carbon combustion engine based transport networks, for instance, needs work. And it needs a collaborative framework to instill labeling systems to help provide transparency to investors and also accounting systems to be able to measure avoided CO2 and look at how we are delivering the impact that is required. So that's 
a bit of a whistle stop tour of what HSBC is doing and how we're trying to contribute to the solution. Um, I've got one more slide to talk through to sum up, which is there's a lot of work going on and we should really celebrate the progress that the financial system has made in this space over the last 10 years. It has been mainly focused on the long-term liabilities of asset owners and how they manage their environmental, social and governance thinking with the asset managers that are, that are, that are managing their, their capital. But it's not really happening quickly enough. So we do have some transparency. We have worked on green bond markets. We are thinking about transition finance, and that is an important area of the future, how to, to shine a light on the companies that are high climate impact today, but need to decarbonize to transform their strategy for the future. But the green bond market is less than 1% of the global debt market. So there's a lot of work to do. The EU has led to a certain degree in this space by working on the taxonomy of activities that can be said as green or aligned with the Paris Agreement. And Asia, in fact, in China, through its climate neutrality goals, has been looking at how to classify activities. Now, of course, countries are moving at different paces and we all want to see more and um, faster. But nonetheless, the celebration of the existing work that has happened and building from that can help us move forward much more quickly to that goal of delivering a net zero economic outcome. I'll stop there because I think I'm over my 10 minutes as well. Um, hand back to Ronan for any questions that have come in from the audience. Thank you so much, Zoe. That was very interesting. That was a particularly interesting slide to, to close on because if, if, if you think across the range of, of um, presentations we've had, we, we've taken a look at that kind of big picture kind of uh, total set of the economy through to through the, uh, the, 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 the um, financial institutions and regulators world and then down into so who is actually spending money out there and and, and what can be done in the future or, or what you know what extra is there needed and i think the second thing that i would point out is is uh, uh, and, and again so you said something about transparency for instance not being news but actually i don't think i'd have had this conversation post 2008 because all the transparency might not have been used. I think the, the whole sense of a need to look at the architecture and rethink how this is all working would not have been anywhere nearly so present. And that is on top of everything else that, that may have happened since then, including falling the price of renewables and, and everything else. So, um, so I'm really keen for questions from the floor. I noticed Tracy have already uh, come in with a question. Others, please raise your hands or if there is a metaphorical way of doing this or write questions in the, uh, in the Q&A. Um, but fellow speakers, you will have noticed that, that, that Tracy has talked about the uh, money supply and allocation. Um, and I think it, 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 you're actually touching on something that comes right to the, the very start of, of what Dimitri was talking about and reflecting on the, the situation even before the um, even before the, the 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 present crisis emerged. Any observations on that? Money supply seems a good high level place to begin. Well, I mean, I I, I engaged a little bit with Tracy on that. I mean, the endogeneity of the money supply is clearly crucial. I always refer to kind of Nick Caldor who. who decades ago pointed out that there's a surge in the money supply every year just before Christmas. That does not mean the money supply causes Christmas. Um, and there's a lot here to do with the institutional architecture and the nature of regulation and supervision of financial institutions that will impinge on the money supply to as, in, in, in a broad sense, uh, to as much of an extent as, you know, um, uh, pricing. Uh, money through policy rates and associated uh, money policy activities. The whole gamut has to be considered. And indeed, the interaction with fiscal policy as well, especially when the fiscal authorities are actually now increasingly uh, buying up um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 issues from the central bank so that the central bank's balance sheet is 
uh, increasingly filling up with public sector debt from primary markets. So um, this just testifies to the point at the beginning that fiscal and monetary coordination are going to have to be ever more uh, closely integrated than they have in the past. And you know, I think the institutions are only catching up with the macroeconomics on this one. And, and there's a lot further that needs to needs to be done no, to, to go. And just to add to that, it's not just any more the monetary and fiscal side that need to be coordinated. It's actually the energy policy and business industrial strategy that hasn't been perhaps so tied up as it's needed to be in the past to address these issues. And I know, you know, for those of us that have been working on this for a long time, we've talked a lot about energy subsidies in the past and the fact that they're perverse incentives to fossil fuel production, for instance, and how that might be amended in, a, in an environment to, to think about shifting behavior towards the, as Bob pointed out, the right allocation of risk reward and capturing the risk framework um, for, from, the, from the energy thinking as well as the monetary and fiscal thinking. Could I just take that on a bit then, because, because when I was uh, listening to Bob's presentation, I was thinking much more about how you then got central banks into that game. And, and Bob, you had a whole slide where you talk that one through. So mm -hmm. Dimitri is referred to, to what's on the central bank's balance sheet, but I I know in other discussions, we're probably all involved in, in parts of them. We're thinking a lot about that, that, you know, the fiscal space is massively constrained by debt overhang and, 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 and so central banks are vitally important. So are the multilateral development banks. Bob, any reflections on how we can bring those into play here? Well, again, and I just, pound on this, we have to have the right incentives and we don't have those. So that's the fundamental problem. Now, uh, in the US, clearly uh, that's Congress and, and that's the Senate right now, the House is uh, ready to, to move. And so uh, I would say even globally, you might say the US is the fundamental blocking uh, point right now. So. Uh, I'm very focused on getting that done. Now, is there a role for central banks? I think yes. Uh, we need, as I mentioned, globally coordinated incentives. And I'm not sure how we're going to get that global coordination. Uh, you would think that that would be part of the UN process. But frankly, the UN has not focused on incentives, sadly. And maybe it's not set up to focus on incentives. It's certainly not focused on globally harmonized pricing of emissions. Now, it's very possible that the NGFS would be an appropriate body to focus on uh, global coordination and, and global uh, incentives. Uh, I would tell you many of the policies that are introduced in, uh, in the US anyway on pricing emissions start with a given price and then have some sort of escalation uh, going out into the future, 4%, 5%, uh, typically real appreciation. Uh, the reality is we don't know what the future is going to bring. This is an optimal control problem in a very uncertain system with new information that's going to be revealed every day. And we have to react to that new information. It's just, it's not even credible to say, here's the price path for emissions for the next 20 years. That's just uh, and so what you really want to do is you want to take it out of the political process. And uh, so we learned that decades ago. We talk about lessons that we learned. We learned decades ago that you want to take the setting of interest rates out of the political process and give it to an independent body like a central bank. In the case of the U.S., the Open Market Committee. And, uh, and that's what we need to do with pricing of emissions. We need to bring it into the uh, realm of science and economics and global coordination. And maybe that's a role for the NGFS, I don't know. But more, more than just pricing, of course, we need oversight of financial institutions and, you know, and that has to do with this, the standard regulatory oversight. Uh, we need appropriate disclosure. We need both those financial institutions and the corporations that they're making loans to, to appropriately manage their climate related risk and report on it. So, all of that is under the purview of central banks, I would say. 
depends on different countries, different, different uh, uh, folks have responsibility for that oversight, but ultimately the central banks are really the leaders in this area. And just to build from that point, so the work of the Bank of England in um, giving us all a climate stress test to work on for next year is game changing in, in getting more people in the room to talk about the right issues in a way that is operational, uh, operationalizable, if, that, if that's a word, in terms of, of managing risk, right? Because what I've learned over the past three years where having moved from the asset management community to being in the heart of HSBC and working across lending, commercial lending and retail lending and, and, and all of the other parts of the financial system is actually there's a massive capacity gap between a knowledge gap between those that have been working on climate change for quite a long time and are very sophisticated in understanding how carbon pricing might work for a company and how their incentives might be able to be implemented to those that are at the very beginning of their journey and don't haven't really thought through how things can work in practical terms with the pricing that they have to think about day in day out to the loan that they're making and how that's being reported in a system somewhere and the fact that the definitions within the system aren't really very climate compliant and yeah that's in the weeds but nonetheless it's still things that have to be overcome to be able to get to a framework which allocates capital to address climate risk and the central bank point is making sure that that will gradually filter down and and the stress testing point is the start it's you know we know that we're not going to have the right approach tomorrow to be able to do this but it is getting a lot of people thinking and it is getting a lot of people in rooms of having to work out okay we we've got to think about this in a way that we can implement it um and that's that's great because it means that we can move at pace I, well, I mean, just a quick, I, just, <laughs> and I think this is a circle, doesn't it, really? This is where, you know, I think where I started from at the beginning, you know, what matters in terms of, you know, all this surplus liquidity uh, and this over leveraging through greater indebtedness that results from years and years of, you know, real interest rates being close to zero is whether the assets that are being built up are actually going to be productive or whether they're going to be stranded. If the assets aren't going to match the balance sheet in a way uh, through generating sustainable returns, we've got a potential debt crisis and systemic risk and uh, all the rest of it, both at the private and at the sovereign level. Uh, so this applies to you know, fiscal overhang, you know, fiscal space as well. Uh, whereas if we put that investment into productive assets, into those assets which are most likely to be compatible with the 21st century economy, uh, we can potentially generate the returns that justify the, the debt and allow uh, growth to erode the, uh, you know, the fixed debt um, whilst uh, maximizing the returns to those assets and absorbing that surplus liquidity and allowing real equilibrium interest rates to start rising back up to normal levels. Um, and I, I stress real equilibrium interest rates rather than policy rates, which if they're going to have to kind of uh, be raised in order to cool a supply constrained economy down will cause huge problems uh, in an over leveraged economy because, uh, well, we, you know, a lot of uh, that debt will simply not be repaid at what used to be normal interest rates. So it's absolutely essential that we expand the supply side. And I think everything should be focused on strategic investments that bring that about. Uh, and that should be the kind of the ultimate long term scope of both monetary and fiscal policy in terms of how the two uh, you know, mechanisms coordinate with each other. Could I, um, I refer to um, an anonymous attendee's question, which talks about the pricing of natural assets, because, so, so firstly, it's quite clearly a compliment to what you said, Bob, about the pricing of carbon. But actually, if I look at through, Dimitri, your very rich set of assets, what you might think of as 21st century assets, I think I could have a good discussion with you about the pricing of some of those too, <laughs> and how we would... How we would establish, I mean, one of the core problems of the, the current economy is we actually don't know how these assets are valued. In fact, we don't even know how some of them are used yet. Yeah. How, um, yeah. How and, people... and, you know, and some about pricing in the uncertainty. And I, and one of the kind of limitations, if you like, of some of the strategic uh, uh, forward looking stress tests that the bank and the NGFS and others have championed 
is that I think they really need to, you know, they need to be more ambitious in, in, in bringing into the realm of scenarios the possibility that some of these changes could happen a lot faster than we think, not just on the climate impact side, but on the climate transition side, tipping points, where suddenly a new technology set is just seen as being superior to the existing one, and you get a very rapid network flip. We're kind of seeing that with renewables. We're kind of seeing that with electric vehicles. We will start seeing that in more and more sectors. You know, 10 years ago, if anybody even sort of, you know, dreamt of the kinds of cost declines we've seen in renewables, that have been laughed out of court. So if you'd had a scenario, um, we'd probably have been told that that's an unrealistic scenario, don't bother, go away. And I think, you know, the NGFS really has to have these quite ambitious uh, climate transition scenarios. They don't, you don't have to believe that they're going to come true, but they should be centerpiece, uh, center stage in your risk management and hedging strategy, because they could happen. And if they do happen, What's your strategy? And if you don't have a strategy, your shareholders will want to know about it. Well, I'm just going to come in on that because I was very struck that at the bottom of your kind of what should be done slide, you picked out scenarios in particular. So, so you had a you had an analysis row, but you had a very definite separate scenario row. Is that what you people were thinking about? We had a whole chapter on scenarios and, uh, you know, it, I, we say, look, of course, whenever you're doing risk management, scenarios is a very important part of it. You've got to think about, you know, extremely bad, but plausible scenarios. And that helps your thinking. Uh, and uh, we also, though, talk about the limitations of scenarios, you know. So I think what the uh, Bank of England has done has really been uh, very uh, thoughtful in terms of a rapid transition versus a delayed transition and thinking about, you know, what the, both the transition risks and the physical impacts of that are going to be. Uh, we didn't go into this so much in the report, but I'll tell you what scares me is the, uh, the increase in the maximum temperature uh, that comes from delay. Uh, that is to say, if we delay pricing of emissions, and, and I, you know, to me, this world is kind of black and white. We are not yet pricing emissions. Capital is still flowing in the wrong direction. Emissions are still rising. We have to get these emissions down to net zero by 2050, which means we need a phase change immediately. We immediately need to have these incentives. And my point would be, even if we immediately slam on the brakes, create those incentives, we're gonna have a maximum temperature around 2070 or 2080, that's gonna be around you know, 1.7 or 1.8 degrees C. Now, you know that's risky. We're only at one degree now. Who knows what kinds of uh, impacts that's gonna have. But here's the scary thing. If we wait 10, degree, 10 years, we're gonna have an additional about uh, two to three tenths of a degree. So we're up into the two to 2.1 area. So the risk is just exploding right now. Whereas 20 years ago, if we waited 10 years, it was bad, but it wasn't crazy. Today, waiting 10 years is just crazy. And so that's the thing that we've got to do this immediately. And we should have done it 20 years ago, but it's too late for that. It's not too late to do it. But if we wait 10 years, we could go off a cliff here. We could hit one of those, you know, non-linearities and positive feedback and, and just who knows what world we'll be in if that happens. So yeah, again, taking that scenarios out. Sorry, Zoe, did you want to come in on that? I was just gonna. Well, it's quite hard. <laughs> that was a quite hard act to follow. It, it is um, really. <laughs> now that we're all terrified. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I was just going to pick up a little bit more on scenarios because because actually building on it, we do the financial community. Some parts, as I said, some parts of the financial community are incredibly advanced on engagement about decarbonisation pathways and future scenarios. But in the context of the overall economy and the global system, it's important, it's critical. I'm not saying that it's not critical, but it is only one part. And there's so much more work to do in the rest of the system because of this 10 year problem that we have. And that it's the fact that it's taken us so long to get to that polarization of knowledge in one tiny bit. So, you know, the scenarios thinking does, is about, yeah, getting much better at doing it on the risk side, but also getting much, much, much better at saying, 
this is transition investment. This is going to take this steel company from being X tons per unit of steel to Y, and Y is down here, and then Z is net zero. Um, and that pathway, that scenario is what we need to really get faster at working on and, and try and actually be, be more transparent about the journey and accepting that renewables are fantastic, but they are binary, right? Renewable power is clean and green and going for it. The vast majority of our economy is built on systems where there, it's going to be a journey and it's not going to be a switch off the light moment. It's going to be investment today on a plant in a certain location, investment tomorrow in a process in another location for, an, a, for a, and all of those are determined by national policies, which is why the global, global coordination point that Bob was making earlier it will speed things up significantly if we had a global carbon pricing, it would really drive change. But I think that is also your point about the coordination of not just managing fiscal policy, but that sequence of energy policies, housing policies, etc. That that all fit with that. And, and and then secondly, I think you're you're making a a distinction that we that I, we really should make more frequently, which is between the scenario in terms of pictures of endpoint as opposed to the roadmaps or however we would describe the routes that we might take. And of course, there could be a number of different routes, but some transparency over that would be helpful. Can I just pick up, moving it slightly further on? So Arthur in the in the chat um, has brought our dear friends in the, the European Central Bank into the question, in, in, into the show, um, and asking if they should already be implementing measures based on the existing data, i.e., let's not wait for even further information. What do we think? I think that the ECB are working quite hard and that the European framework is working quite hard on this. And yeah, they should be, like, everybody should be moving faster. It's kind of, that's, that's a given. Um, but within the parameters of governance, which also is important, it's, it's work in progress, which is not the greatest answer in the world. But from my perspective, it's, it's not as if it's not in the room, as it were. Okay, let me, so, so you, you've mentioned the, the G word of governance because there was something that I know had been in the back of our minds when we were first setting this, the whole series, but I think particularly today's event in which it has to do with the architecture, the institutional architecture by which this is done. And, and, and it's, it's really interesting across the sweep of the three presentations that we have looked at really quite complex interactions. And in order for those interactions to work, there has to be some kind of architecture. We already have central bank architecture. I spent much of my working life in, in various different regulators. So I'm, you know, I love governance and regulation and, and that kind of architecture. Um, but, is there an architecture that we now need? Should the evolution, for instance, of the European Central Bank be part of an architect, an architectural evolution or revolution? What do you think, Bob? You you have the carbon price controller. Yes. Well, I, I, <laughs> we don't have an appropriate, you know, global governance structure, right? That's one of the real uh, frictions yep. here. Yep. And. Uh, yep. Your comments so, in the UN as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we do need that. Now, is that a central bank infrastructure? Is it a UN infrastructure or is it a new uh, authority? I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, it would be nice. I, I've been a fan of uh, ICAO, the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization, taking a lead on this as well because. They have a strong global governance structure. Aviation has a uh, you know, strong claim on the remaining capacity for CO2 in the atmosphere. They need that. They have no cost-effective way. So uh, you know, either they're gonna be paying for biofuels uh, 
and that's going to be very expensive, or they're going to lead on pricing emissions and save some of the current capacity so it doesn't current you know doesn't all get wasted. And any and if they set up a, a globally harmonized price for emissions in aviation, that will that will be the lead, and you know the rest of the you know world can follow. But you know that remains to be seen who and how we do it. But we absolutely need a a price setting mechanism to create that global harmonization. And Dimitri, and you were thinking about the, the kind of interaction with fiscal policy and the, you know, the, the thinking that you've done about where uh, the kind of the layering of investment over time. Likewise, is, is that to be left to kind of purely political process? Is there a type regulatory type intervention or, a, you know, how could we, give greater certainty, and I'm still thinking of Zoe's last slide here, greater certainty to that growing graph there. Yeah, so it's a very interesting point and in linking that into, you know, Bob's um, uh, focus on incentives. And I think incentives on the margin are very important. But as we're increasingly talking about things that are not about marginal changes, in other words, you want to set the um, you know, appropriate environment to generate entirely new markets and potentially entirely new networks. My colleagues, um, Philip Aguillon and Darren Oglu refer to it as uh, you know, kickstarting uh, the clean energy machine. And, and you know, the, the analogy is apt because you have a strong push at the beginning for technologies that are actually much more expensive than some of the sort of you know, quick, you know, low hanging fruit that you can undertake. Um, so you apply a differential carbon price for those technologies, a higher carbon price, a more ambitious policy in order to generate innovation because these sectors have the potential to see the fastest reduction in cost and the greatest innovation until such point when the machine is running that you can just ease off the policy altogether because this technology and this network becomes clearly superior to the incumbent. So everybody moves to it anyway and it pays for itself. But you need to get over that sort of initial hump uh, and the policy environment there has to be much more strategic because at the time when you're addressing that policy, the advantages aren't readily available. There may be co-benefits that you can point to in terms of you know, local pollution or uh, in, improved uh, energy security or whatever it is. Um, but for the most part, there has to be an upfront investment. And for the most part, because of the network effects and the spillovers and the rest of it, it's probably going to have to be uh, public. But that's a focus on dynamic market failures rather than your more conventional static market failures and static inefficiencies. And that, I think, from an institutional architecture point of view, because it's more strategic, does require some sort of coordinating body at the public level to try and um, not only steer investment to provide the vision and the credibility to galvanize private sector investment and allow uh, policymakers to take on policy risks for this whole uh, process, which is going to take a number of years, um, rather than you know expect the private sector to take on risk that it doesn't own. So I think that's very important. And then on top of that, because you're going to have to have more intervention, you're going to have to have greater safeguards to protect competition and to protect consumers as well. Because if this just becomes a sort of pork barrel uh, lobby exercise for kind of the government's friends to take on new contracts, that's not going to be an benefit either. So a lot of thinking there about the, uh, you know, institutional architecture to bring about the kinds of changes we need. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to be easy, but we need to start addressing it now. Dimitri, with that, the, the stopping music has sung in my background, but I think that was a really good kind of sweep of, of what would be needed to, to help that. Dimitri, Zoe, Bob, thank you so much for your presentations, for the discussion, and I hope for, for how we can carry this on. Thank you everybody uh, who asked questions and who tuned in for joining. Uh, and thank you Delaney and, and E3G for, for helping set this up and, and making it go so well. I think our next workshop in this series is actually tomorrow afternoon uh, with Uli Vols at uh, SOAS, but speakers today, Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. So the equivalent of hand clapping, etc. <laughs> Thank and you. Have a good Thank rest you. of the day. Thank you. Take care.